Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Beck and I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on back to school means back to school sports presented by UCLA Health as well as the Orthopedic Institute for Children. Uh, I am Dr. Jennifer Beck. I'm the Associate Director of this, for the Center of Sports Medicine at the Orthopedic Institute for Children. I'm also an Assistant Professor at UCLA David Gethin School of Medicine in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'll have this email address up later on as well, but this is an important email address to write down. OIC Sports Medicine at mednet.ucla.edu is a place you can go for follow-up questions after this talk. Additionally, during this talk, I want to make sure and encourage to have questions posed on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, or also you can comment on our Facebook page. This is live and interactive, and at the end of this webinar, I will be taking questions, so if you have questions that come up during this talk, please feel free to post them either on Twitter or Facebook, and we'll get to them at the end of this talk. So I have no disclosures for this talk. Our goals for today are really uh, twofold. We're going to go through some tips and tricks for returning our athletes safely to team and school sports. We're going to focus a bit on the fall sports, which include football, cheerleading, volleyball, cross country, tennis, golf, and water polo. Although I'm not going to go specifically sport by sport, because that could be a half an hour talk in each of them, this talk was really designed thinking about these sports and what we can do to help keep our athletes safe. We're going to go through two different sides of injuries. We're going to go through medical and safety concerns and those type of medical injuries. And then we're going to go through just a top quick list of knee injuries that young athletes commonly get, since that is the most common injury I see in my office. The common health and medical concerns we're going to go through are heat illness and heat and dehydration. We're going to go just briefly through concussions, talk about sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest, and then just really try and emphasize the importance of rest and recovery in our young athletes. On the knee side of things, and the musculoskeletal injuries, we're going to go through some acute injuries and what to do and when to see, uh, seek help. We're going to go through some chronic injuries and then also what's with these popping knees. That's a common question that I get in my office is what popping knees should really be see, uh, seen by a medical provider and what other ones can really be ignored. So we're just going to start talking about these health and medical concerns. And as you've probably gone through already with your young athletes is this concept of participation clearance for getting back. There's really three key parts to this. The first one is the annual physical exam. Then you should have some concussion information or notification sheet. Then you should also have an info sheet on this sudden cardiac arrest. There's also some other important information as, as insurance and emergency contact information. But those three pieces of information, I really uh, implore to you to take seriously, read over them, and not just think, oh, I just have to get a doctor's note for a clearance. There are actually some important keys to this that I want to make sure and address. So a couple important things that I want to make sure that you know of about uh, that are CIF regulations and rules, uh, we're going to go through a couple of them. So practice allowance is a really important thing. We know that right now youth athletes are going through a lot of overtraining, which is learning to a lot of burnout as well as overuse injuries. So CIF has actually come up with some rules about how much athletes are allowed to practice. They really should limit it to about 18 hours per week. They really should do more, no more than four hours per day. And we know these infamous double day football practices that they have, those really should be limited and not held on consecutive days. Athletes, if they are doing double day practices, should have at least three hours of rest between those practices. And the only exception really to this rule is golf, just given the long duration of 18 holes of play. I think this is really important to take notice of is that your athletes are going to be participating this much in their school sports and really as parents and coaches should monitor what they're doing outside of this to make sure that they're not overtraining and really burning themselves out. When it comes to a couple sports specific things, CIF does have one rule in regards to what kind of medical attendant they need and it's really that schools or districts are encouraged to provide an athletic trainer or some sort of medical personnel at, at every inner school scrimmage or game. This is really only an encouragement, it's not a request or a requirement and it's only for football. We do know that football has one of the highest rate of injuries as well as catastrophic head and neck injuries. So I think it's important as coaches and staffs to really encourage your schools to take this seriously and try and make sure there is some sort of medical staff that's there at scrimmages in games that can help take care of your athletes. Something that's also very important that comes up in the realm of tennis that actually came up from USTA was the concept that athletes must warm up before play. 
Tennis is the only sport that actually has this rule, but I think that this is something that should be across all sports and really doesn't matter the sport. If it's running, football, cheerleading, warm-up is a very essential part of the practice process, and it's the best way to help prevent injuries by making sure you're stretched out and your muscles are ready for participation. So what are the coaches expected to know? If you're one of the parents out there and you're not sure, these are really the only rules and requirements that CIF has for coaches. The first one is that they understand some sort of sport physiology. They need to know about fitness in sport, some side, uh, some side effects of steroids, some nutrition, just some general guidance type information, very basic. They're expected to know CPR and first aid, and then they're expected to know the signs and symptoms of concussions and sudden cardiac arrest. I do want to take a moment just to comment that CPR has changed in the last couple years and the ABCs that used to be that everyone is familiar with has actually changed recently to CAB. So compressions are now the most important part of this. Airway is second, breathing is then third. So if you haven't brushed up on your first aid skills recently and you're taking care of young athletes, make sure and go seek out your local Red Cross or first aid so that you can get updated. So equipment and surface at the beginning of any school year is something that's really important to take seriously is from both coaches, parents, and athletes. And that's something that they potentially could have been neglected, sitting inside a storage container all summer long, no one's really paid attention to. Maybe they haven't looked at them since last season. But that's something at the beginning of every season and every school year you really should look into. And that's everything from helmets and pads, how old are they, what condition are they in, do you have proper sizes, mouth guards and importance of mouth guards for protecting um, oral dentition. And then take a look at the fields and surfaces or pools that you're in. Especially in the drought conditions we have, any athletes that are taking uh, part in sports that are on grassy type surfaces, really that field is something that should be taken care of to help prevent injuries. So heat illness is something that we have a little bit of an issue with here in Southern California, especially if you're out towards the eastern part and the more deserts, um, something that a lot of other states down in the south, this is something that athletes die of every single year and it's completely preventable. I do want to make sure that you understand there's really two forms of heat illness. One is heat exhaustion, that's the more minor form. And that's when the athlete still is sweaty, they may have a little bit of clammy type skin, they may have some mild symptoms such as headaches, some confusion, some personality changes, maybe they have an upset stomach, some nausea and vomiting, but overall athletes are typically able to still play through this, so you have to really be cognizant and watch out for these symptoms in your athletes. Heat stroke is when your body temperature has gotten so high that you actually no longer perspire. That's when the hot, dry skin comes in. So if you see your athlete and you're checking out your athletes and you say, oh, they can't be overheated, they're not even sweating, well, at that point, it's almost too late and that, can, and that is a medical emergency. And fevers are associated with this, confusion, fainting seizures, cardiac arrest. This can be a very devastating complication and this is where we lose athletes every year. If you are in one of those locations that heat stroke and heat exhaustion are a potential complication, or if you know that there's going to be a big heat street coming up in your neighborhood, make sure that your coaches, athletic trainers, and your schools have ice baths on hand, and that's the fastest way in order to take care of these conditions, is sudden submersion in an ice bath. What are some other things that you can do to prevent heat illness? The most important thing is adequate hydration. As a parent, you really need to make sure your athlete is arriving to their sport well hydrated, that they haven't been out playing in the heat all day, they haven't, you know, just, or they've been having just some energy drinks of some sort. You want to make sure they arrive well hydrated. You also want to make sure your athletes have access to chilled water or sports drinks so that they can have some electrolyte replenishment. You want to make sure that as a coaching or the medical side of things that your athletes have frequent breaks and everyone needs to encourage these athletes to drink every time they have a break. If it's a sip or two, it doesn't really matter. Make sure and encourage them to constantly hydrate because the athletes don't realize how much liquid they're actually losing through their perspiration. In very extreme situations, hydration status can actually be monitored and the way that we do that is by having weigh-ins. So athletes come in at the beginning of practice, have to weigh in, and then weigh out at the end of practice. Depending on how much body volume and body um, loss, mass they've lost determines how much they really may need to rehydrate. The general rule is for each kilogram, or about 2.2 pounds, the athlete needs to replenish 16 ounces of fluid. 
after, if you're a parent, you need to make sure that your athlete continues to drink until they really have a clear fluid stream uh, for their urination. And I would encourage you to make sure if it's really hot out there, they're doing double day practices, that they keep drinking water or some sort of electrolyte replenishment sports drink until they, they are urinating frequently and it's also a clear color. If it's dark yellow color, that means that they're dehydrated and they're not properly taking in enough fluids. Also important for coaches is the gradual nature of their practices. If it is hot outside, make sure they start in just thin clothes and they're not starting right away with pads. Make sure the duration and the heat is limited in the, build, in the beginning and then you finally build up to having more and more heat. Some basic additional prevention measures are make sure that you have medical coverage, so if there are any concerns for athletes, they, they can take care of it. You want to make sure your athletes are dressed in light, uh, synthetic clothing that's light colored, and there's also lots of new technology about water wicking away to help keep the um, school skin temperature dry and also cool. You want to make sure that your athletes are avoiding those caffeinated stimulant time drinks because those are things that can help increase their heart rate and increase their perspiration and dehydration. If it is going to be a big heat streak, you want to make sure you may need to alter plans and you may need to change it to a morning practice instead of an afternoon practice, and that's really up to the coach and the athletic director's discretion. Making sure that you have rest breaks and when you're taking those rest breaks that you're, you're hydrating, encouraging your athletes to hydrate. And then also, if you are wearing helmets and pads, that you take those off during the rest breaks so that that way you give your body a moment to cool down. So we're just going to touch on briefly some sudden cardiac arrest. Really the thing, the important things to know is that it's, it can be preventable if identified risk factors are found as part of that pre-participation physical. That's really the screening tool we use now to see if any child needs any further workup. So take that pre-participation physical very seriously. Really the rules that we have now is that if there's any athlete that's found who's passed out or fainted or we're not sure what's happened, they need to be immediately removed from that practice or that event and they can't return that same day. They need to then have some sort of medical evaluation in order to find out what happened to them. Was this from a cardiac etiology or what exactly happened from this? This machine that's right here that's posted in this picture is what's an AED, which is a defibrillator, that all schools should have these days. Depending on the, the size of your athlete and the, and the uh, size of their chest, there are pediatric size pads. So if you are a, young, a coach of younger students and younger athletes, I would make sure that you have the right size pads and that you have proper pads that are working. That's something that should definitely be checked at the beginning of every season. Concussion protocol is also something everyone should know. Similar to the sudden cardiac arrest uh, events, this is if someone is suspected of a concussion during a practice, they need to be immediately removed and they can't return that same day. That's actually a state law and most states have this law now. So if there's any suspicion of concussion, they need to be immediately removed and can't return that same day. Most schools are requiring some sort of medical clearance to return to sport and so I would have you seek out sports medicine physicians that are trained in concussion management and diagnosis so that you can properly have your child taken care of. If they are diagnosed with a concussion, it's important to remember it's a, a up to seven day type process even to get them back into activities and there's very gradual steps that we go through to get our athletes safely back through uh, to play. One important thing that we're just starting to learn more and more about is how do we prevent concussions? We really are learning about the long-term effects of concussions, so how do we prevent kids from getting these? There's a lot of myths out there about helmets and pads and mouth guards, and the research has shown that really helmets and mouth guards and pads don't do anything in regards to concussions. Concussion is actually a spinning type motion. It's not a direct hit to the head. So these mouth guards and pads really aren't able to protect from that spinning motion that causes concussions. The couple things that we do know that are important are learning proper technique, especially when it comes to football, that you don't want to lead with the top of your head. That's one thing that's been shown to reduce the amount of head and neck injuries. We know that younger kids who have very large heads in comparison to the size of the rest of their body have very poor head and neck motor control. So there are some physical therapy programs that can help teach them how to properly hold their head that may help reduce their risk of con concussion. The one solid thing we do know is that athletes who are properly rested and get proper amounts of sleep have reduced risk of concussions. So I, I think as parents, you need to really encourage your athletes to shut down at night, turn all their electronic devices off, encourage good sleep hygiene for at least six to eight hours every single night. So that leads me into this mandatory dead period and rest period that are rules from CIF. Uh, so the main rule is that three weeks prior to any main sport, you're supposed to have no contact really with your athletes and your coaches. And that's allowed to allow your athletes to really prepare and rest. 
during season, you need to make sure that your child and your athlete has at least one full day of rest. That doesn't mean that they're playing football with friends intermittently with their other football sports. Is that that is a day that you truly want them to rest. They need that recovery in order to help make sure that their building blocks, their bones and their muscles are all getting the, the rejuvenation that they need so that they cannot be injured or have any overuse injuries. So after we've just hit on some of the medical as well as health and safety concerns, I just want to talk about the couple top knee musculoskeletal injuries that I see. We're going to go through acute, which is sudden onset type injuries. We're going to go through chronic and then popping knees and what to be concerned about. As I just mentioned, the acute type injuries are ones that are sudden, that the patient or the athlete knows that they got hit on the side, something dramatic happened. Usually it's a one-time event, they have immediate pain, immediate swelling. Chronic injuries are something that have a slower onset, that the pain is more gradual, the athletes have a hard time deciding, well, when did it really start, or when is it really makes it worse, makes it better. Usually the details are a lot harder to sort out. So, and then also I just want to talk about a common question I get is what is a sprain versus a strain? So a sprain you can think of as in your ankle, as in an ankle sprain. That's actually a ligament injury. That's when a ligament which connects two bones gets torn or gets weakened. A strain, on the other hand, like a hamstring strain, is an injury to a tendon. So that's an inj a tendon is what connects a bone to a muscle. And so it's very similar type injury patterns, but that's how we use those as a sprain and strain. So just to go through some of the common knee injuries, we're going to talk about the acute knee first of all. First of all, the most important things are red flags for parents and coaches to know. If you bring your child to the emergency room or in urgent care, if you see any of these things, if you see something out of place or the limb just doesn't look right, if you see large cuts or breaks in the skin, if the athlete's not able to put any weight on their leg, if they're not able to move their knee, really bending or straightening it, that's something to be very concerned about, if they have an immediate amount of large swelling or bruising, and if they have intolerable pain that really is not relieved from over-the-counter pain medications. If they really have a smaller type injury, the times I would recommend going to more of a clinic appointment within the next couple days is if they're able to move their knee, but it just hurts a little at the end when they bend or straighten it. If they have pain after an injury that lasts more than a few days, or if their pain requires around the clock pain medication. If you notice they have a more gradual swelling or swelling that remains for a few days or even weeks, those are all things that I would be seen in a clinic for. So in acute knee, we often see that, that people are recommended us into the sports medicine practices for a knee sprain, and that's just kind of a generic term for an injury to the knee. Some common knee injuries that we see are ACL tears or anterior cruciate ligament injuries. That's something that most people have heard about that we know is an increasing trend in our young athletes. MCL is a medial collateral ligament. That's also a ligament on the inside part of your knee, which is a very common injury we see. The meniscus can be torn or moved out of place, and that's a meniscus is a shock absorber cartilage in between your two bones that can be injured. Also, you can have patella or kneecap dislocations when it moves out of place and either stays there and someone has to push it back in or it just pops right back into place. Also, some common fractures that we see are growth plate fractures. Girls grow until about age 14 or 15 and boys about age 16 or 17. So if you're younger than that, you have open growth plates and have potential uh, injuries to your growth plates. Tibial spine is a common fracture that we see that's, that's not commonly heard of outside of um, orthopedic surgery. Kneecap fractures and then there also can be fractures of the cartilage inside your knee. So those are all things that I worry about when I see these acute knee injuries in my young athletes. What you're going to do is you're going to be seen in follow-up and we're always going to start with some sort of x-ray to help try and diagnose what the problem is if we see a fracture or we see what the injury is. If it's not related to the bone, which is what's seen in x-rays, then we move on to more advanced imaging like an MRI. This image up here is an MRI image that you can see of an ACL tear or that anterior cruciate ligament tear that's only diagnosed really on MRI. Really, the treatment can vary depending on what the problem is. It can vary from just a simple brace, maybe a cast, maybe some physical therapy, all the way to needing surgery. So it's important for athletes and coaches and parents to really be seen by sports medicine specialists if they do have these signs or symptoms. Chronic knee pain is a common thing we see more towards the middle or end of season. That warm-up is the most important way to try and prevent these, as well as making sure you get adequate rest. Common things we see are like Osgood slaughters, tendinitis, patellofemoral syndrome. Those are very common things. There's also some unique things called osteochondritis desiccans that we see in kids, which is actually where a portion of bone dies because it sees too much weight, too much activity. 
And then, as I mentioned earlier, meniscus tears can also be a more subtle chronic type injury. The follow-up for these is really important because when you have these symptoms that go on in these duration, we have to make sure we know what the story are, when it, things started, what their history has been, and the physical exam is going to be very important. So making sure you're seeing a specialized provider is very important in these long-term knee pain cases. Similar to the acute knee injury, sometimes you're going you're to start out with x-rays and then you may need more advanced imaging. And similarly, it, the, very, the treatment can vary widely depending on what the diagnosis is. So the popping knee. Lots of kids come into my office and say, oh, I can pop my joints in and out all these different places. Well, when do I really mind and when do I say, oh, that's okay, just try not to do it. The most important thing is if you have pain that or popping that causes pain or if you have any swelling that's associated with it. Those are two things that are absolute red flags. That if your child is popping their joint and it hurts or they have swelling afterwards, those are reasons to see a sports medicine provider uh, in the next few days. The reason is that there can be causes that are often surgical for this problem that can be fixed, that if they continue to have these problems, it just causes more and more damage. Sometimes it can lead to cartilage damage. Sometimes it's that kneecap popping in and out of place. Again, that meniscus can have a tear that can be flipping in and out of place, or you could have a loose piece of bone or cartilage floating around your knee causing damage. These are all things that we worry about. So if your child has pain or swelling with popping, definitely be seen by a sports medicine provider. The treatment, as I said, can be surgery, but there are other, some other treatments such as bracing and physical therapy. So before I go into these top five take-home points, if you want some more information about these common musculoskeletal conditions, I do have another talk that's on the UCLA Health YouTube channel. So I refer you to that, and it goes into upper extremity as well as lower extremity injuries if you're wanting some more information. So the top five take-home points for today is our young athletes should never play through pain or any sort of symptoms. I went through the red flags for knee injuries, but those are very common for other types of injuries. Make sure you're listening to your child. Many of these injuries can be avoided from both the medical side of things as well as the safety side and the musculoskeletal side. So really do everything you can to try and prevent these injuries. Know and make sure that you abide by any sort of your league restrictions or sort of requirements. If that's the warm-up, if that's the amount of hours they're practicing or limitations they may have, make sure that you know what those are and you abide by those. Make sure as a parent and a coach that you're encouraging your athletes to get enough hydration, to have proper diet, to have proper rest. When they're in season and exerting so much energy, they need all of these things in order to recover and prevent for future injuries. And lastly, if you do have any of those red flags, you have any concerns, always come and see a sports medicine provider so that that way we can help you diagnose what's wrong with your child and get them back safely to sports. So a couple important prevention tips that we went over is, again, make sure that you know what your safety equipment and conditions are. Check those at the beginning of the season and make sure your athletes know as they put these on, put on pads and helmets, that they're checking them to make sure that they're being used properly, fit properly, and they're in proper condition. Make sure, especially for football, that you know proper techniques. That's a great way that you can prevent injuries is if you have proper coaching and proper techniques. Make sure, again, lots of fluids, lots of rest. That's very important. Make sure you know the right warm-ups and cool-downs. That's the best way to prevent overuse musculoskeletal type injuries. And in the end, this should all be fun. So we're trying to help prevent you to have injuries so you can keep playing active, keep staying in your sport, and that way hopefully you have a long-term lifetime of using these uh, sports for good health benefits and also for having lots of fun. If you've got some questions or some more information, here's the two clinics where I'm at, one in Santa Monica at our Santa Monica Orthopedic Hospital, and then also downtown at Orthopedic Institute for Children uh, down on Adams Street. Our phone numbers as well as our emails are here, so ortho-institute.org, and then this website down at the bottom, the OIC Sports Medicine at mednet.ucla.edu. If you want some more information about those musculoskeletal conditions, go over to our YouTube channel, and hopefully we've got some questions that we're going to finish up with here. So a couple qu important questions. So first of all, if you're a parent, coming from one of the parents, if you come home and you think your child has a concussion but you, the coaches or no one noticed it, what do you think you should do? So I think the first thing we should just mention is that concussions pre present in very differently in different athletes. Parents know their athletes the best because you can see subtle personality changes and personality signs, maybe a little grogginess, a little inattentiveness of these subtle concussions that maybe the coaches don't pick up on. I think the most important thing is don't let them go back to sport. 
the risk of having a second injury to their head can make their symptoms and their diagnosis and their treatment much more difficult. So seeking care with a, a sports medicine provider right away the next day so that you can make sure that your athlete is diagnosed properly and treated properly is the most important thing. As I mentioned, coaches only know basics of concussion management, but if you have an athletic trainer or medical provider at your school, that's someone that you could potentially go to and talk to. But don't just ignore them, especially if you're a parent and you think something's going, going wrong with your child and potentially concussion, don't ignore those symptoms. So what can I do as a parent to prevent heat illness? So just to kind of reiterate, I think the most important thing you can do is make sure your athlete shows up to practice well hydrated. Make sure that they've beforehand, even up to an hour or two hours beforehand, have cooled water or sports nutrition type drinks that have some electrolytes. Make sure you send them away to practice, that they've got lots of water and hydration and that you encourage them when they have breaks to continue to hydrate. Also pay attention to the clothes they're wearing, especially with our teenagers. You want to make sure that they're wearing light clothes and they're not showing up to practice in fleece and heavy sweatpants because the clothing can make a big difference. So make sure you pay, pay attention to what they're wearing as they're going into practice. Uh, and then the last question is, well, if my child does have some sort of injury, they're getting back to sport, has some sort of injury, a musculoskeletal injury, how do I know when to let them back to activities? And that can be very hard for parents trying to decide, well, can I, do I need to have them seen? Can I just decide and hold them out for practice for a couple days? Really my tips for that would be if your child has pain for more than a couple days or swelling for more than a couple days, I would have them seen by a sports medicine provider. Kids we know run and fall down and can get some bruises and if they have aches or pains for just a day or so, maybe that's something that you can let them back and see how they do. But if they're continuing to have pain, continuing to have limping, or you think that their swelling really hasn't gone down in a few days, I would have them seen before returning to play. We want to make sure that they're safe to return to play, but if there's ways that we can help prevent this injury from happening again, that's what sports medicine providers will be able to do for them. So I want to thank everybody for paying attention to our webinar today. If, again, it's going to be on our Twitter uh, using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or also on our Facebook. It'll be going up onto our YouTube channel as well, so look out for that. And thank you very much.